The situation for those stranded in San Bernardino County, California, doesn't seem to be getting any better. Whole towns have been entirely snowed in, meaning people can't leave their homes, let alone their neighborhoods. This has been going on since late last week, so supplies are starting to dwindle. Uh, this Goodwin's grocery store wasn't completely sold out, but you can see they have not been able to keep up with demand. I was hoping to get some milk because I ran out of milk and some eggs, but they, they're all sold out here at the store and it's tough to get supplies right now because pretty much everything's closed. Gas stations are also running dry. In the town of Rim Forest, there was no regular, no diesel left, only high octane. All the while, rescues are happening all across the county. And joining me now is Don Rowe. She's a chair of the Board of Supervisors in San Bernardino County. Don, how are those rescues going and, and who's the most vulnerable right now? Our, our elderly and our young are the most vulnerable and our county sheriff and county fire and office of emergency services are in unified command with other cooperators to get to all of those vulnerable folks that can't get off the mountain because they're still stuck up there. And Don, as I understand it, in San Bernardino, you guys are one of the largest in the nation, right? One of the most populated in the nation. How, how do you make sure that everyone is accounted for in a situation like this? Um, it starts with neighbor helping neighbor. That is the first and foremost thing that we encourage. If you haven't seen your neighbor, please go check on them. Um, we have call centers set up, so we are able to take in calls. Of course, 911 remains um, an option if it's life-threatening. Um, if you'd like, I can give your listeners our, our number that we're asking, our stranded residents, if they're in need of food, baby formula, things like that, that they can call for assistance. And is it a situation where you deliver it to them no matter how much snow is on the ground? I know that uh, snowmobiles have been out, which is weird because you don't think of San Bernardino and, and snowmobiles. But what do the rescues look like and, and what do the delivery of supplies look like? So County Fire has, um, we have snow cats that are going in and delivering those essential services, uh, likely medicine, food. Those are the type of things that we're delivering right now on County Fire snow cats. And then um, if they need to be medevaced out, then they, we have air assets that can do that. Our county sheriff has airships that can take them out and county fire can also get them out on their snowcats. And have you, have you had to do a lot of airlifts in the county? No, no airlifts as of yet. Right now, county fire is assessing everything on the ground with their ground equipment. And what's the most pressing need in the county right now? So I would say that it is assistant from our state for plowing and road clearing. So road clearing, and are people staying off the roads or are they staying home? I know that when you've been cooped up in your house for quite some time, like there's this need to get out, even if there's a lot of snow on the ground, are you finding that problematic? Well, no, because our mountain roads are closed. So if you are a local resident, Caltrans can escort you up the mountain during times where it's safe. It's not really, it's passable, but one lane passable in many spots. And so that is done by a CHP and Caltrans escort. In our neighborhoods though, we, we have yet to have plows into a lot of our neighborhoods um, because we, we will head towards neighborhoods and then you'll have a down power line or a down tree. We've had to resource, uh, redirect resources to help Edison crews get up to clear the areas to restore power. Um, to a lot of our folks that haven't had heat for a number of days. So it's a matter of additional resources that are needed. So wild to think that there are still places that are inaccessible uh, right now. Don, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And we want to bring you some breaking news out of Ventura County, California. That's a sinkhole that you're seeing that's opened up in front of the Santa Paula High School there. And as you can see, it's already swallowed up an entire car. County and local police are evacuating the area because the potential collapse zone touches several buildings nearby, including the high school. County officials say no one's been hurt. And let's bring in NBC News meteorologist Bill Karens. Bill, I know it's winter. I know this is expected in other parts of the country, but uh, here in L.A., in Studio City, I was at lunch, and then all of a sudden everybody in the restaurant looks outside, and it is snowing in Studio City, the middle of L.A. <laughs> Only lasted for like two minutes, but 
Are we going to see more of this? Oh, you were a weather watcher. You could have, like, taken pictures. You could have, like, <laughs> sent me the video. That was that's awesome. I know, but you're not the only one. A lot of people in California were seeing stuff like that this week. But this does look like the end of it. The storm is moving out. You know, it's been epic in the mountains. Uh, Mammoth reported five and a half feet of snow with this storm. I mean, they're having a hard time clearing it. They're having a hard time getting to people that are still trapped because of all the snow. I mean, there's pictures of plows that are just stuck and can't even move. So we still have about 9 million people impacted by this. The heaviest impacts will be from the Grand Canyon, the Flagstaff, and the they call this area the rim from Prescott all the way back here to Pine Top. These higher elevations outside of Phoenix, that's where they're going to get the one to two feet of snow. And eventually some of this will go into northern New Mexico. We're not expecting a lot of snow in any big cities like Denver's not going to get much. Albuquerque's not going to get much. You really have to be driving through the higher passes. What's going to be interesting about this on Friday and Friday night and Saturday, this storm will then produce heavy snow in certain areas. Northern New England, definitely. Snowmobile country, loving this. Ski areas, loving this. Six to 12 inches. Not a lot for Boston. Not a lot for Hartford and hardly any, if anything, from New York City. And watch out, somewhere between Detroit and Chicago, Gotti, there will be a narrow, heavy band of snow that will produce 6 to 12 inches. We don't know exactly where it's going to be yet, but it'll be heavy and wet, and likely trees will get uh, damaged, and there should be some power outages. And, Bill, we're starting to see those severe weather threats for the rest of the week coming in. Uh, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, this will be the huge story come tomorrow. It may even be like the lead story on all the news broadcasts across the country. So we do have a risk of severe storms tonight. Very large hail, isolated tornadoes. We already have a tornado watch that is up from Texarkana to Little Rock. We do have one tornado warning. So isolated tornadoes are possible tonight. But tomorrow's the big day. Tomorrow looks like a severe weather outbreak. Not only could we get tornadoes, we may even get a few strong, long track tornadoes. Those are the ones that do the most destruction. Those are the ones that are most deadly and they could even continue after the sun sets. The area of concern is from Austin to Waco to Dallas and then all the way through southern Arkansas and northern Louisiana and eventually into areas of Mississippi and southern Tennessee. This big red bullseye is where we think there's the best chance of those strong tornadoes. And even into Friday, Gotti, we'll still see strong thunderstorms all the way through the southeast. So it's going to be one of those cases. We're going to get tornadoes, even strong tornadoes tomorrow. We just have to hope they don't hit anything. Yeah, such a good reminder to stay vigilant. NBC's Bill Cairns, thanks so much. And turning now to South Carolina, where the double murder trial of Alec Murdoch is wrapping up. The prosecution delivered a very, very lengthy closing argument today that lasted nearly four hours with reminders like this one on who the trial is for, the victims, Paul and Maggie Murdoch. We couldn't bring you any eyewitnesses because they were murdered. But common sense and human nature can speak on behalf of Maggie and Paul, and they deserve a voice. The prosecution also making sure to take this jury back to all the lies Alec Murdoch has admitted to, and even the ones that he did not own up to while he was on the stand. He backtracks, he pivots, and he tells a new story from that stand and looks you all in the eye. And then when new evidence comes up on cross, he backtracks and he pivots and he tells another new lie. Now, it's important to note that this was already a very long closing argument after a very long day of the jury taking a highly anticipated field trip to the Murdoch family estate this morning. That's where the jury got to see everything that they've been hearing about for the last six weeks. NBC News correspondent Ellison Barber joins me now from Waterboro, South Carolina. Uh, Ellison, let's start with the jury's visit to the Murdoch property today. How much time do they have there? Uh, what do they see? Yeah, so once they actually got there, it's about a 40-minute drive from the courthouse here. They arrived at court first and then headed over there. They had 30 minutes, roughly, on the ground to take a look at some of these areas that we have heard the prosecution and the defense talk so much about, things that they have seen, a lot of photos, uh, many of them graphic from the night of the murder, but hadn't seen in person themselves. So they were able to go to the dog kennel area and see the spaces where where Maggie and Paul Murdoch were killed. They were also able to walk up and take the this, this path from the kennel all the way up to the main house and see the outside of the main house. They were not able to go inside it, but they could see the outside. A really important rule before they left was that they could not ask any questions that was of law enforcement or lawyers who were there on the scene with them, also of their fellow jurors. They couldn't ask any questions. They couldn't talk to each other or to any 
anyone at all. They were just there to look before they arrived there. They did get a reminder that the scene had changed since this happened and that things would be a little bit different. But other than that, this was strictly a viewing visit. There was a, a car, a van that went with them of some members representing all of the press. And after the jurors saw things, took a look for themselves, the press was then able to go visit and see the same things that the jurors saw. Uh, one of the reporters representing all of us out here said that she was able to see from her car one juror go up to the feed room. Remember, right outside that area is where Paul Murdoch's was killed, where his body was found uh, face down. They were standing in that feed room and according to the pool reporter, looking up into the doorway and really looking around in that area. That feed room has become sort of central to the defense's uh, argument of what they say happened. They have said that they believe, based on what their experts have said, that a shooter was inside perhaps that feed room. And they have argued that Alec Murdoch, at the time of these shootings, was too heavy set, too tall to have maneuvered his way in and around that area, and then also shot and killed Maggie and Paul with two separate weapons. Gotti. Uh, some incredible insight there. So the jury had a very, very full day. They went on that field trip, and then the prosecution went on for a while this afternoon, four hours. How did that go over with the jury? Right. I mean, it was a very long day for everyone. At one point before the lunch break, our producer who was inside the courtroom said she saw the judge rub his eyes and seem to try and hide a yawn. It's a lot to process, a lot to follow. This is a trial that initially was expected to be about three weeks and already it is six weeks. So jurors are tired. Everyone is tired. That being said, there were a lot of really key moments where it was almost impossible not to perk up and, pl and pay really close attention. But but regardless, a jury is instructed to pay as close attention as they can to all the details throughout this trial. And from everything we know, that's what was happening today. Uh, we saw the prosecution really go through a specific timeline, rebutting some of the specific claims made by experts from the defense and really trying to drill home this narrative that they say Alec Murdoch is a really good lawyer and a really good liar. And he used both of those skills to try and convince you there's no way he would do this. But they said, remember, he told a lie when he was under oath. Listen to this moment. He said his name three times that Sheriff Smalls, the former sheriff of Hampton County, gave him permission to put blue lights in a private vehicle for a part-time assistant solicitor and blue lights in a private vehicle. He told you three times, effortlessly got up there, pivoted and lied to you because Sheriff Smalls came in here and said, uh-uh, of course not. They kept saying that Alec had a perfect uh, storm, a gathering over his head, and that he felt this was his only way out. They said, Gotti, he had motive, means, and the opportunity. Gotti. And now we see what the defense says tomorrow. Ellison, thanks so very much. Right. A whopping 100 million Americans use TikTok, but there's a chance we might find ourselves without that endless scroll on our phones sooner rather than later. This morning, the House Foreign Affairs Committee voted to advance a bill that would give President Biden the authority to ban it nationwide. But why is all this happening? Well, lawmakers on both sides of the aisle are worried about the Chinese government owning a stake in the popular social media app that holds a lot of information on American users, and they say that poses a security risk. It gives the Chinese Communist Party the ability to manipulate our social discourse, the news, uh, to censor and suppress or to amplify what tens of millions of Americans see and read and experience and hear uh, through their social media app. Meanwhile, TikTok is unveiling a feature that's meant to be a safeguard for teenage users. NBC's Jake Ward has more. Hey there, on the heels of a punishing week of news for TikTok, including both a federal ban and political moves toward a possible outright ban of the app in the United States, TikTok is announcing new safety features aimed at trying to uh, limit screen time, especially for young people. These new features include an automatic 60-minute limit on usage for anyone under the age of 18. In order to go past that limit, you'll have to enter a passcode. There's also uh, various family 
family pairing services, including the ability to look at your weekly usage and for parents, the opportunity to spike certain hashtags that you don't want your kids to see and a way to set custom screen limits for yourself. This will also supposed to be uh, accompanied by a general rollout for all of us of a screen time limit down the road. Now, this, of course, all comes in the context of uh, a time when social media is trying to get out in front of what has been shown to be a dramatic increase in depression, anxiety, and suicide rates among young people. Uh, depression and anxiety doubled between 2009 and 2019, uh, which coincides, of course, with the rise of social media, although scientists say it is hard to link those things other than, you know, in any sort of causal way. It's really just correlation. Um, but the, you know, the, the unmistakable drumbeat is here. We heard from the president uh, at the State of the Union talking about the mental health crisis and then firmly putting social media and the need to regulate it under that. And so this seems to be TikTok's effort uh, to regulate it alongside other major social media companies. Uh, what difference that will make, we don't know. I asked TikTok, why 60 minutes? Why is that uh, the uh, approved amount of time? And they said there is no general scientific consensus on what is considered too much or too little screen time, uh, that this is just a starting point, but that they're going to be going forward from here. So a move on uh, uh, for TikTok users toward a limiting feature um, that uh, asks users to take responsibility for their own screen time uh, by setting limits for themselves. Back to you. Jake Ward, thanks so much. And still to come, capping the price. People who rely on insulin to live have been waiting a really, really long time for this. Plus, we're going to show you something else that's saving lives. It's a heart in a box. We're going to explain the game changer tech when we come back. In 1923, the man who discovered the life-saving properties of insulin famously said, insulin does not belong to me, it belongs to the world. And instead of making millions of dollars on a patent, he sold his patent for $1 to a public institution. Well, fast forward 100 years later, and insulin is the poster child for high drug prices. But today, drug maker Eli Lilly made a move to change that. It is slashing the price of its insulin in a move to bring relief to millions of patients. And starting May 1st, Eli Lilly's generic brand Lispro will cost $25 a vial, down from about $82. And by the end of this year, the company says it'll lower the list price of two of their most prescribed insulins by 70%. The drug maker is also capping the monthly out-of-pocket cost for insulin to just $35. Now, Eli Lilly is one of three main insulin makers, and they've faced a lot of heat over the years to lower their prices. A study last year found that over 16% of insulin users rationed their medicine because it's so expensive. That adds up to over 1 million people in the United States. When you're type 1 diabetic, it's you against the world, and you feel like every single person is stopping you from getting that medicine you need. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Kavita Patel joins us now. Dr. Patel, for years we've heard from some of those 8.4 million people in the United States with diabetes who rely on insulin, and some of the medical bills that they have shared with us are outrageous. Uh, is this something that you've seen in your practice? Patty, yes, I practice in one of 1,500 community health centers around the country, which mainly includes low insurance and uninsured people who can see hundreds to thousands of dollars of out-of-pocket costs. And so it is a very big deal if we can get prices. This is something that's real. And as you know, not just one in five and in black and brown communities, that number is higher where they just skip or forego life-saving medication on a daily basis. I'll never forget, we went to Mexico with one group that was just looking for cheaper insulin. They found it there. One person started crying right. when they saw the difference between the, the prices in Mexico for the exact same insulin as they were paying here in the United States. Uh, doctor, I got to ask, this seems like progress, but I can't help think back to how a century ago the patent was sold for $1. Why do right. you think it's taken so long to slash the price as much as we're seeing today? Gotti, you started this in the intro. There are only three manufacturers. That means that there is very little market competition. And when you only have three manufacturers making the majority of insulin products in the country, they pretty much work lockstep with each other. What you saw Lily do today was also kind of a clarion call for the other two major manufacturers. And hopefully they will follow suit because of the pressure. But previously, they've been all pretty much keeping prices either at the same rate or increasing them year after year. And Gotti, I just want to put a plug in. It's something that's helped my own patients. The American Diabetes Association, insulinhelp.org, 
a nonprofit trying to help people navigate this because you may hear the news today, it's not gonna hit most people out of pocket until the end of this year, but people need solutions now and they need to find those low cost solutions as quickly as possible, insulinhelp.org. And Dr. Patel, real fast, you know, I, I wanna be an optimist. Do you think that this could be a turning point, not just maybe in insulin, but in a lot of other drugs, <laughs> uh, seeing such a dramatic price reduction? Yeah, yeah, so I'm gonna put my policy hat back on. You saw the Inflation Reduction Act with President Biden signed into law. That specifically contains provisions to lower the most expensive drugs starting in Medicare, but it will have an effect on other insurance programs. So I do think that 2023 and beyond is about lowering drug costs, out of pocket, getting people healthier because we can afford it. Dr. Patel, fingers crossed, thanks so very much. And turning now to another possible game changer in the future of medicine. Right now, there are more than 100,000 people in the United States that are in need of an organ transplant. And unfortunately, 30 of them die every day just waiting. But thanks to a new technology dubbed Heart in a Box, access to organs is expanding and saving more lives. NBC News medical fellow Dr. Akshay Sayal spoke with one patient about how one of those beating hearts in a box saved his life. But a quick word of caution, we're gonna take you inside side of an operating room, so some viewers might find this hard to watch. John Baggio was dying. His only hope, a heart transplant. Without one, his doctors at Northwestern Medicine only gave him weeks to months to live. He was barely able to walk across the room. He was short of breath, even lying in bed. Other organs were starting to fail as well. John became one of the nearly 3,500 patients on the heart transplant list, with wait times that can last up to six months. But doctors at Northwestern are at the forefront of a cutting edge innovation that might be able to save John's life. It's called Transmedics Organ Care System Heart, also known as Heart in a Box. It keeps a donor heart beating outside a body for up to 12 hours by giving the heart warm blood and nutrients. The Heart in the Box device is the biggest advancement in heart transplantation since the 60s and 70s when it started. A heart transported in an old school ice cooler would typically last just four hours. That extra time means medical teams can now travel further than before to get a donor heart. Doctors at Northwestern estimate that the device can make up to 30% more hearts available for transplant. After five long weeks waiting in the hospital, John was in danger of losing hope to one day dance again with his wife. I can only get through half of uh, Johnny Be Good now. So I wanna see if I can get through the whole song again. <laughs> Mr. Baggio, Hello. Dr. Fab, can I come in? Of course. All right. Time was running out until his doctors got a call for a donor heart that typically would have been out of reach. Thanks to Heart in a Box, it was go time. All right. And then if everything goes smoothly, we're expecting about four or six hours of surgery. So everything went really well. We've got the heart on the machine, monitoring the flow and the blood pressure as well as the rates of the medications that the machine is giving to the heart. Everything looks quite good right now, very happy. The heart, wheeled into the operating room, beating in a box. And three hours later, that same heart, beating in John. Hello, Mrs. Baggio. Hi, it's Dr. Pham, how are you? We finished with the heart transplant. He, we got a great heart for him. What's the most gratifying part of all of this? I would have to say seeing uh, our patients go home, spending time with their families, enjoying their lives again. John already achieving his post-surgery dreams with a lot of heart. <laughs> wow. And Dr. Sayal joins us now. I, I gotta ask, was that Johnny B. Good? Did he finish the song? He finished the whole song, and you know, I've seen this a few wow. times now that still brings a smile to my face. Yes, he finished the whole song. <laughs> Oh, wow, and to see that heart beating outside of a body and then to see him, him dancing there, wow, just so inspirational. Dr. Sayal, uh, just how many hospitals are, are using this heart in a box? Yeah, guys, so there's about 29 uh, centers across the country in the U.S. using this heart in the box. And this is technology that's also, you know, there's a liver in a box and there's lung in a box. So now it's, now it's the heart in the box that's up. But, you know, we talk all of, uh, on the, in the news a lot about news you can use. And I just want to say a quick word here. That's, you know, the reason John was able to get this, he actually found a newspaper clipping of the, of the heart in the box and he took it to his doctors. He really advocated for himself. So for all of those out there who are either waiting for an organ, have a loved one waiting for an organ, 
side and really, uh, you know, bring this up to them, advocate, tr just try to, you know, br just, <laughs> sorry, just bring this up to them. And it, it is something that can really make a difference in terms of how many hearts are available uh, for transplant. I am absolutely blown away, doctor. Thanks so very much for joining yeah. us. <laughs> Anytime. And still ahead, is this what a royal eviction looks like? Prince Harry and Meghan Markle have been asked to vacate their home in the UK. The details are ahead. But first, you gotta see this. An 800-year-old mummy was found in a food delivery bag. Yeah, you heard that right. South American authorities say the body of an adult mummified man was discovered in Peru. It was stuffed inside of a delivery bag from the Uruguayan takeout company, Pedido Sia. NBC News has reached out to Peruvian National Police to ask how, but so far we haven't heard back yet. It's time now for some of the big headlines we're watching tonight. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle have been asked to give up their UK Frogmore Cottage. That's the one near Windsor Castle, which was their home base when they visit the country. The 10 bedroom property was a gift from the late queen. And some reports say this eviction request was sanctioned by King Charles. Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot is on her way out of office. She lost her bid for re-election, making her the first incumbent Chicago mayor to do so in 40 years after failing to get enough votes to make it to a runoff. A man in Pennsylvania is in custody after an explosive was allegedly found in his checked luggage at the Lehigh Valley Airport. The man left the airport but was later arrested at his home. The CDC is warning about a drug-resistant bacteria that causes stomach bug symptoms, and while the infection is mild for most, it can be serious for some vulnerable groups. And Nissan is recalling over 800,000 SUVs. It's over a key problem that can cause the ignition to shut off while driving, and it can also cause power brakes and airbags to possibly not inflate during a crash. At first, it was people living in East Palestine getting sick. Now, some of the workers sent there to clean up are saying they're getting sick as well. In the days after the Ohio train derailment, several train company employees have been reporting migraines and nausea. And all of that cleanup operation continues right now in places where the toxic waste is headed are questioning why are they being chosen as a dump site? And NBC's Gabe Gutierrez joins us now. Gabe, earlier today you were in East Liverpool. That's a town about 20 miles away from where the derailment happened. Uh, an incinerator there is one of several sites where toxic materials are going to be shipped to. Uh, can you explain to us what's going on in that community? Sure, Gotti. There's a lot of frustration in that community by uh, from some longtime residents who really have been fighting uh, the company that runs this incinerator, um, Thermal uh, Heritage Thermal Services. Uh, the, the incinerator first opened back in 1992, and it was a source of controversy back then. And over the years, it's faced multiple uh, lawsuits as well as uh, EPA violations. Um, although uh, the company has never admitted any wrongdoing. Well, earlier today, we spoke with several of those residents who have been fighting a battle against this plan for quite some time. Take a listen to, to what some of they had to say. How many of you are worried about this situation? They've just not been showing themselves to be good neighbors. The facility never should have been here in the first place. So, God, you can imagine for a community, East Liverpool, again, 20 miles south of where I'm standing right now in East Palestine, this community has been dealing with this uh, this company uh, for 30 years. And they just heard earlier this week that some of the toxic dirt from East Palestine would be brought there to that incinerator. They just have a lot of questions at this point, Gotti. And what does the company running that plant have to say? Well, Heritage uh, Thermal Services, uh, you know, they, they did release a statement to us. They did not get back to us about an on-camera interview. But let me read uh, from some of that statement. It says that it is fully permitted to manage the materials generated at the derailment site and that the company stands ready to do its part to help protect human health and the environment. And we should point out, Gotti, we also spoke with the mayor of East Liverpool earlier today, and he said uh, that, you know, the company, in, in his words, had uh, ensured him that it would be able to handle these materials and he took them at their word he said that the EPA um, had permitted them for this and he trusted that they would be able uh, to safely dispose of those hazardous materials Scotty 
And Gabe, we also heard today that the CEO of Northfolk Southern is going to agree to testify before Congress. What can we expect from that testimony? That's right. Well, the details of that testimony are still being worked out at this point, Gotti, but he is uh, expected to testify uh, sometime uh, perhaps later next week in front of a Senate panel, and he will face tough questions uh, from lawmakers. Gotti, as you know, uh, this derailment has become such a politicized issue, uh, you know, both from environmentalists on the left and also conservatives on the right who feel uh, that the Biden administration had to, has not paid enough attention uh, to this. So uh, Norfolk Southern CEO certainly faced tough questions from those uh, lawmakers and even today federal regulators you know have announced stepped up inspection of this uh, of the railway system really uh, nationwide so expect them to get a lot of questions about what exactly happened and how uh, his company plans to prevent this uh, in the years ahead got it a lot of questions indeed Gabe thanks so much in Greece, search and rescuers are looking for survivors after a passenger train carrying hundreds of people crashed at high speeds with a freight train. It happened right there, some 200 miles north of Athens in northern Greece. At least 43 people were killed. Dozens more are being treated for injuries. The country's transportation minister even resigned over this. And according to the Greek prime minister, it appears as though the crash happened because of human error. Sky News correspondent Siobhan Robbins has more. Twisted and broken, carriages derailed. These are the remains of two Greek trains after one of the deadliest crashes in decades. It was just before midnight near the city of Larissa when an intercity service collided with a freight train. In the dark, passengers described panic, screaming, an impact which felt like an earthquake. <laughs> At least four of the carriages came off the tracks before several caught fire. All I remember is feeling a sharp breaking suddenly, seeing sparks and flames on the sides of the windows and then a sudden stop. At the sudden stop, we all panicked, went outside, broke the glass, and then we were faced with chaos, chaos. The passenger train with around 350 on board had been traveling from Athens to Thessaloniki when it happened. Some of the victims were thrown from the carriages when they crashed, others trapped inside as they burned. The train just started to jerk more and more until we ended up at a 45 degree angle. So all the way to the front of the train I went and saw to the front the worst part of the collision right in front of me. The whole train had bent 90 degrees, had fallen over the cliff and half was hanging in the air. The whole thing was on fire. I jumped on him, then we fell down. A woman with her child was with us. Then we sat down, it had caught fire next to us and the guy found a hole. So we all managed to get out of where we were. We were in a cabin, we don't know what happened in the front cabins, but the people behind us were okay. Visiting the scene, the Prime Minister offered his condolences. The Transport Minister was distraught. Breaking down, he promised a full investigation into the tragedy. Later, handing in his resignation, he said, out of respect for the dead. As recovery teams pick through the wreckage, the army's been called in to help. Many of the injured are being treated in Larissa, with two other hospitals on high alert. Among the dead, eight railway workers, including the drivers of both trains. A 59-year-old station master has been arrested as part of the investigation. It's still too early to say what caused this crash, one of the worst in Greek history. Siobhan Robbins, Sky News. And turning now to the horrific murders of those four University of Idaho students back in November, Pennsylvania. Uh, the home estate of suspect Brian Kohlberger just unsealed some key court documents, including the search warrant for Kohlberger's family home. It's shedding new light on the evidence that prosecutors might use against him. In a surprise pre-dawn raid in late December, law enforcement arresting Brian Kohlberger at his parents' Pennsylvania home, taking the suspect into custody after a six-week manhunt. Now in a newly unsealed search warrant, we're learning what else authorities took from his family home that morning. Among the items, a flashlight and medical gloves, an assortment of clothing, including a black sweatshirt and black and white Nikes, and a cheek swab, presumably for the suspect's DNA. 
According to two sources familiar with the investigation, NBC News learned investigators used forensic genealogy to zero in on Kohlberger, possibly using DNA recovered from a knife sheath found near the body of one of the victims. In a previous search of Kohlberger's apartment in Washington State, investigators also gathered possible hair strands, chemical resistant gloves, items that had red and brown stains, and a computer tower. In December, Kohlberger had driven home with his father to Pennsylvania from Washington State University, where he was pursuing his PhD in criminal justice. On that trip, the pair were pulled over twice in Indiana weeks before the arrest. How y'all doing today? They were driving a white Hyundai Elantra, the same type of car police say was captured on surveillance video near the scene of the murders. Kohlberger's school less than 10 miles from the University of Idaho and the off-campus home where four students, Zana Kernodal, Ethan Chapin, Kaylee Gonzalez, and Maddie Mogan were found stabbed to death on November 13th. A surviving roommate telling authorities she saw a figure dressed in black in the home that night. Now Kohlberger is awaiting trial on four counts of first-degree murder. He has not formally entered a plea, but has said through a former attorney that he believes he will be exonerated. Meanwhile, the community of Moscow, Idaho, is trying to move forward. I feel better, sort of, knowing that they, they have the suspect in custody, that there's a chance that this might all be behind us soon enough. The university announcing the house where the murders happened will be demolished, calling it a healing step and a way to stop efforts to further sensationalize the crime scene. And after the break, dramatic surveillance video of a cashier attacked in a grocery store. Details on the search for who did it are straight ahead. Plus, we saw what the earthquakes did in Syria and Turkey. Now Los Angeles is looking to make sure its buildings can withstand that kind of shock as well. That's all ahead, so stay tuned. There's a woman named Lisbel Rodriguez Luna in the Bronx who went to work on Sunday expecting it to be a normal day until a group of women came in and brutally attacked her. And it turns out the main attacker might have been a disgruntled shopper from just a few days ago when she got away. Now the grocery store is offering a large reward for information leading to her arrest. WNBC's Chris Jose has more. Tonight, surveillance video showing a group of women pummeling a grocery store cashier in the Fordham Manor section of the Bronx. The victim, afraid to return to work following the attack. We'll be talking to her next week to see how she feels to come back to work. But right now, she's a little bit shaken up with the situation. Food Universe owner Pedro Goico, who's currently on a work road trip, giving his employee, Lizbel Rodriguez Luna, paid time off for the week to heal mentally and physically. We will not let this cancer take over our business and employees. Goico says a woman who wanted to exchange her recyclable goods for cash got into an argument with Luna last week. The woman threatened to come back with force if the cashier did not let her skip the line. On Sunday, Goico says the disgruntled customer returned with two other women claiming to be her daughters. The cashier blindsided with a blow to the head. Seconds later, her hair pulled from behind. Security guards and other customers trying to intervene. Right now, we are offering a $2,500 reward to anybody that gives us information. NYPD searching for the attackers. Goico now beefing up security by adding more workers up front. We're very concerned uh, because she's very scared. We don't know if people are going to come back or try to harm them in any way. Goico also sending a message to state and local leaders tonight. He wants to see an assault on grocery store workers become a felony level punishment. Chris Jose, News 4 New York. Thanks, Chris, for that report. Another earthquake shook Turkey today, and more billions uh, buildings collapsed after a 5.6 magnitude this time. Tonight, millions in Turkey and Syria are sleeping in tents three weeks after that 7.8 magnitude quake rocked that region. And the death toll has risen past a staggering 50,000 people. And look, these disasters overseas have so many earthquake-prone cities in the states wondering how our buildings would hold up along fault lines that will tremble and will definitely shake in our lifetimes. San Francisco in 1989, where 63 people were killed and billions of dollars worth of property was damaged for one. One entire city block was destroyed by the earthquake and a huge fire. In addition, inspectors say scores of houses have been so damaged structurally, they'll probably have to be torn down. Damage to the city is now estimated at $2 billion. And anyone who lived through the Northridge here in L.A. in 1994, where a 6.7 killed 72 people and injured 9,000, will not forget it. Now, it is important to remember, that was a 6.7.
Scientists say there is a 75% chance that a 7.0 or greater will hit Southern California in the next 20 years or so. L.A. County is trying to get ahead of that by requiring retrofitting for older concrete buildings. And joining us now to talk about all this is Jonathan Stewart. He's a professor at UCLA's School of Engineering and an expert in earthquake engineering. Thanks so much for joining us, Professor. Uh, first off, uh, ever since these earthquakes hit Turkey and Syria, when I walk into an old building here in L.A., like the first thing I, I want to know is, has this building been retrofitted? Do we know if that's happened all across the board? And, and how do you make sure that the building you're walking into is safe? Well, retrofit is uh, very non-uniform across the region. It really depends on the local ordinances that are in place. So, for example, in the city of Los Angeles, there was an ordinance passed in 2015 requiring certain buildings to be uh, updated and retrofitted. And those are older reinforced concrete buildings and uh, soft story wood frame structures, usually with parking at the first level. What does retrofitting even look like? And this has been going on since 2015. We're now to 2023. How far along are we? And, and what ret retrofitting do we need to see? Well, we we tend we need to retrofit structures that we know have a significant collapse risk, and we know this from past earthquakes where we've seen these structures come down. Um, so the provisions that were passed in 2015 were a positive first step, but of course they only cover the city of LA and a few other cities that did the same thing. And just because the ordinance passed doesn't mean the buildings have actually been fixed yet. Certainly some have, but we have a ways to go. This is one of those things where you know that the chances here in Los Angeles, you know the chances in San Francisco are very, very high, that we're going to get hit with a big one in our lifetime, possibly in the next decade, uh, possibly even earlier. And yet they've been talking about this for quite some time, and we still don't have all these buildings up to code. Why is it taking so long? Well, it takes a tremendous amount of political will to mandate, right? It's one thing to make it optional, which has been there all along. But when you mandate, you can really move the needle. And that's been a fairly recent phenomenon. Uh, and to the credit of the politicians that made this happen, it, it, it occurred when there had not just been a devastating earthquake. It actually happened uh, as something that they recognized as a problem, and they took action to do it. But you know, once you pass the ordinance, it, it takes a while to secure the funding, to even identify the buildings that need it, and then to get that construction done. So we're making progress. We're making great progress compared to many years prior, uh, but it's a long, a long process. Uh, but I'm encouraged by the fact that, that we're seeing progress, and with this recent action by the county of L.A., uh, that is growing into new areas of Southern California. I got to say, there's nothing like seeing some of these buildings collapse in real time from the videos that we've been seeing out of Syria and Turkey. Do you think uh, that seeing that happen right in front of us will possibly expedite this process? There is no doubt that when you have a major disaster, it increases public awareness, obviously in the place directly affected, uh, but also around the world. It, the, the images out of Turkey, as you mentioned, are just devastating. And uh, the fact that this is causing some action here is a small positive to come out of that tremendous catastrophe. Professor, thanks so much for your expertise. Here are your 60 seconds of joy. This now viral video shows a face emerging. If you look close enough at a wave off the coast of England, photographer Ian Sprout says he snapped about 4,000 pics that day, but that one takes the cake. And if you've ever flown with kids, you might know the struggle of not getting seated together on a plane. Chance the Rapper, he knows about it as well. But get this, on a recent flight with his daughter, a nice gentleman offered to switch seats. Guess who it was? Yeah, a Martin Short. Chance took to Twitter to give Short a shout out. He says his daughter is obsessed with the Santa Claus 3 movie. So, of course, she freaked out. And that does it for us. I'm Gotti Schwartz for now tonight. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.